Hello, and welcome to the Thinking Elixir podcast, where we cover the news of the community and learn from each other. My name is Mark Erickson. And I'm David Bernheisel. Let's jump into the news. First up, Phoenix now comes with Daisy UI. In a decision that is sure to make some people happy and other people angry, it is a new default. So when you do a Mix Phoenix new, instead of the core components, the way it's been, it's saying, hey, we're going to bring in a component library that's already styled. So you don't have to like futz with and change core components. And so that has some people upset because like, that's what I like to do. I could just do little tweaks and customizations to the core components and... <laughs> This is saying, you know, it's a whole different approach. So I'm sure people are going to have mixed feelings or be on one side or the other. I think the big benefit here is the out of the box experience for someone who's exploring Phoenix. It's going to look and feel a lot better, a little bit more like what they might be familiar with in other frameworks, other languages. I don't know. What do you think about this, David? I love it. You know, I'll, I'll be on that side of the fence. I'm okay with this. Like, I, I've been a Tailwind fan, and mm -hmm. and and this is uh, Daisy UI is a Tailwind library component design system. It's very well thought out. It's got lots of components. The website is beautiful. They are on uh, version five at this point. Mm -hmm. They have their own Discord, right? Like. When you got your own Discord, you're pretty <laughs> mature, right? That's that's a benchmark. <laughs> and I know that uh, I know that in my personal experience, the core components file mm -hmm. is just a freaking mess. It's not something that I love to dive into. You know, I I'm just not a designer. I'm not, I'm not yeah. as much as I'd love to think I am. I'm not. <laughs> and so having that mess out in Daisy UI. And those friendly defaults, which just like Tailwind, Daisy is able to be ripped out of your project if you have that much of an opinion or, or your organization has their own design system, like no problem. And, and again, we're only talking about the generators here, not like Phoenix itself, you know? Right. So I really don't think that this is this is something to get up in arms about for the, for those that don't like the don't like this bit of news. But I think generally a lot of folks are going to be happy with that. You know, yeah. Yeah spin up a quick project it's going to look good and then once once you get to the point of like having an opinion on your design system then you could either customize daisy and tailwinds and and roll with it or rip it out and do your own thing which is also you know not that bad <laughs> so yeah i'm very happy to see it actually came by as a surprise to me i didn't i didn't see this coming <laughs> and then it happened i'm like whoa oh okay cool i know i, I was i was caught <laughs> off guard by this one too so i just wanted to read a little bit from the the pr there was a lot of comments and people saying i think this is a bad decision and here's why and other people i think this is a great decision and jose weighed in and i just wanted to quote a little bit of what he says here he says, as mentioned in the original issue, we do encourage everyone to continue building component libraries on top of Phoenix Live View. Daisy UI is CSS only library agnostic, which means it cannot provide dynamic functionality or fully accessible tools out of the box. So there's still plenty of needs to provide fully featured and rich experiences. We also know that there are different approaches for components and there isn't a one size fits all. Some developers will prefer black box components where you don't see the source. Others will prefer libraries that copy the components into your application so you can manage them. One of the reasons we picked Daisy UI is precisely because it doesn't change the status quo much. It's just a Tailwind plugin and additional classes and therefore replace core components remains as contained and as easy to do as before. So. It's interesting. So there's still the continued effort like, hey, you know, if you want a full featured component system that has hooks and all these other things that come with it, this is not that. Right. So there's still this, a place for that and saying we still encourage people to build that if that's what you need. Anyway, I just thought that was interesting. Wanted to pass along some of that perspective and uh, some of the, the consideration that went into this, too. Today's Thinking Elixir show is brought to you by our friends at Gig Elixir, the premier deployment platform for Elixir and Phoenix projects. If you use the promo code THINKING during sign up, you get 20% off the standard tier prices for an entire year. That's THINKING at gigelixir.com or visit gigelixir.com slash THINKING to sign up today and get 20% off your first year. Thank you, Gig Elixir, for supporting the show. All right, next up, we got the EEF uh, Security Working Group. Uh, they released their objectives and roadmap as the Aegis of the ecosystem. Uh, I had to look up that word. I've used it. 
I've used the word age, <laughs> Aegis, ages, a e g i s, A-E-G-I-S. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I don't know if I ever really knew what it meant. <laughs> just did, by context clues, I figured out what it meant, and it turns out I was using it right. So go me. But uh, just for those that don't know what that word means, it means protector. So as the protector of the ecosystem, uh, uh, generally speaking, yes. right. Uh, and they've got a, a page published uh, that that outlines all the things. So we can go back to the episode where we uh, where we interview uh, Jonathan uh, Meachin and uh, Alistair Woodman of the EEF. They talk about that uh, a bit on their episode, but this uh, includes more. And so I'm gonna I want to talk just highlight the more bullet points here that they have on their plan is uh, they're gonna uh, go through a couple of audits, the core tooling governance audits, the supply chain security audit. We probably mentioned that in the podcast episode last uh, last time, uh, but they're also going to include uh, some hex vulnerability handling and hex account security. Uh, hex account security uh, includes things like implementing web authn for uh, hex accounts, which is pretty cool. Hex API credential security and then the hex build provenance. Each of these bullet points, you know, I'm just I'm not even going to go into a, a lot of them. But they all have their own page. So you go to the link uh, that we'll have in the show notes, or you'll find it at security.rlf.org slash Aegis, and uh, you'll be able to find it from um, from there as well. But there's two there's two that I wanted to actually uh, like point out a little bit for uh, us Elixir fanatics here. Hex asset side loading, right? So I don't know if you've ever mixed depths.get, and then one of those things uh, starts fetching a NIF somewhere and you'll see the URL of where it's fetching from, usually GitHub, you know, something like that. Well, that's it's getting it from GitHub because that's that's kind of, the, I don't know, it's one of the places out there in the internet where you can just kind of store assets willy-nilly and uh, track uh, releases. But wouldn't it be nice <laughs> if Hex could su- support those as well? So that's one of the initiatives here is to allow for ex- uh, Hex asset side loading short examples they have there are are things like storing the pre-compiled NIFs out there. Uh, another example would be like the CLDR data. And so I imagine that could make things more consistent in our ecosystem, but then also having it in HEX is uh, one way that the security working group would be able to do regular scans of those, you know, and, and, and have control of those. So that way, again, this is about supply chain security is, is to make sure that it's in a good, uh, a good spot in our supply chain. And then the other one I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about is the software bill of materials. This is the one that I got confused on uh, last <laughs> time. And so they are actually, uh, it looks to me, it looks like they are planning for something like this where Hex uh, or all the build tools, really, it's not just Hex, would I- integrate with uh, software bill of material support, you know, into the tool chain, right? So Mix for Elixir, Gleam, and Rebar 3 for, for Erlang. They go into it a little bit in the episode, but the idea is that we're not going to hand roll all of these things. We're really just going to uh, create integrations into existing tool chains out there like the ORT and scan code. Those integrations you know, uh, support a variety of other ecosystems as well. It's kind of the standardized, quote unquote, standardized way of generating these kinds of things. And so uh, the build tools would be able to generate a software build of materials, including the source, the build, the runtime and cryptography which is quite ambitious. I don't know how they're going to do, how they're going to do that, but uh, we'll, we'll find out, I guess. Yeah. Um, and that includes the Cyclone DX and the SPDX uh, formats uh, for for those that are wondering. So, not here today, but on the roadmap. So that's very cool. I'm very excited to see that. So that's episode two forty five. Where we talk to the EF, if you want to go look that up. But that's all that we'll talk about today. So the rest of it, you have to go find out on the the Security Erlf uh, webpage. Got a lot of links from there. And next up. Erlang OTP 28.0 RC2 has been released. So right now, the current public release is 27, and this is going to be OTP 28 RC2 now. And the big improvement with this one is following on with what we're talking about there is SBOM, the Software Bill of Materials. And that's actually included in this release. So this is where you can start to get a glimpse of what this looks like. So if you go to the GitHub releases page, you've got a link to this in the show notes. At the very bottom, there's a section called assets. And if you expand that, you can see there is a file called bomb.spdx.json, and it's 3.5 megabytes. And there's a bomb.spdx.json.sig store, like a signature store, and that's 4.6 megabytes. These are bigger chunks of code they're meant to be machine readable right like that's the purpose it's not like you're going to sit there and audit and go through all of this it's to have that as 
that build materials, kind of that proof of what's in here. And one of the things we learned about in that EEF interview is there's different types of S-bombs, right? There's the licensing content, who owns this? And then there's the separate stuff about software, build flags and things like that. And that this is not that second stage yet. Thought that was really cool. And so we're starting to see it, right? We're starting to see some of this work coming out in the new version of OTP that's on the horizon. And in this release itself, OTP 28, there's a new feature that I thought was just interesting. There's functionality making it possible for processes to enable reception of priority messages. And this has been introduced in accordance with EEP 76. That's the change process they use. And so we have a link to this EEP and it's really well documented, including diagrams and everything that kind of help you understand what's going on. But the abstract says a lot. It says in some scenarios, it is important to propagate certain information to a process quickly without the receiving process having to search the whole message queue, which can become very inefficient if the message queue is very long. And this EEP introduces the concept of priority messages to the language which aim to solve this issue. Normally, we just treated the mailbox like a mailbox, like there's nothing to separate one piece of mail or message from another. It's all in there in order. And you can look through the mailbox and say, is there anything I should cherry pick first? And when you get a really long queue, that takes more time. And there might not be anything important in there to even look for. And it just takes time looking for it to see maybe it's there. So this is like a way of flagging it, having it come up very quickly. So I kind of think of it as like being able to send an interrupt message to a process. It's probably not going to interrupt what it's doing in the middle of its because it's still, you know, a process is sequential, but it kind of puts it at the front of the queue in a way of saying, hey, this is when you really need to take a, a look at. And that really makes sense, you know, if you're wanting to send a controlled shutdown to something that has a large queue of pending work. And that could then say, oh, well, I need to shut down rather than work through all the stuff I have. Um, maybe I'll do something else. But anyway, it's just thought that was a cool, interesting feature. I kind of imagine it being most important in some of those lower infrastructure type libraries. You know, it's not necessarily my live view app is going to need to do this. Very cool. All right. Next up, uh, the keynote of Code Beam America 2025 was uh, published on the YouTube. We're going to see it as Designing LLM Native Systems is by Sean Moriarty. Very cool talk. I skimmed through it. I did the old YouTube skim and like uh, <laughs> dragging the thing in round to see what he was talking about. <laughs> It's actually a really great talk, even if you're not really that interested right now in like the implementation of like LLM systems. It's more like the more holistic view of uh, using LLMs in your uh, in your code base, you know, for a variety of reasons. It's more on the architecture of like how to leverage it, uh, which I thought was really interesting and the culture around it as well. So if you're sick of AI talks about uh, with all these terms of things that you don't know what they mean, uh, this is not one of them. <laughs> this is not one of those talks, which is refreshing. Uh, and so Sean, Sean Moriarty does a great job of breaking it down and seeing ways that it could be implemented, you know, or, or, or integrated in with your your typical code bases. Mark, I'm sure you have lots of opinions on this, too, and uh, other tie-ins. Yeah, we don't have a lot of time, so I'll just be very brief. Um, one of the things that's interesting is I've been seeing other news talking about companies abandoning their early work of saying, hey, we're just trying to proof of concept, AI initiatives, and like 42% of the companies, this is uh, from a S&P Global Market Intelligence report, 42% of them were abandoning that work. They were citing reasons like uh, the cost, data privacy, and security risks. I thought oh, that's an interesting perspective, but then when you tie that in with what Sean is talking about, and he's saying a lot of companies are just trying to say, we have an existing product, we're just gonna try and bolt LLMs into it, and that mm -hmm. is a bad experience. And I think that's the kind of thing that is failing. And what Sean's point is, is that LLMs deserve better, your product deserves better, to truly unlock the potential of LLMs, we need to start thinking about how to design systems that are LLM native. If you were to rethink the whole idea of how this project will solve this problem, if you start with the LLM, you'll get a very different design than what's been designed, you know, than the, the systems that have come up from a decade ago. So mm -hmm. that's where he's coming at. I think he's right. Um, yeah. It'll be very interesting to see, you know, where the, everything goes from here. All right, next up. 
A new project with big aspirations is LiveView Portal. It's a JavaScript library for embedding a Phoenix LiveView page into another website. So previously we've seen things like, I've seen this plenty of times where you have an iframe, right? I'm gonna put an iframe into this other website, let people put it wherever they want, and then it will iframe back to a live view. And then you're having to build in some stuff around the edges, you know, to have the page communicate information in and get information out per potentially. So this is taking a different approach. This is a little bit of JavaScript code that you put in that uses the shadow DOM to isolate the styles and it actually sticks it in there. So this is not using the iframe. So this is very interesting. I don't really know much more about it at this point. I did see that they're trying to make an effort to have this be upstreamed into LiveView official, some of the changes they had to make to the LiveView JavaScript and maybe mm -hmm. any changes that are required on this the LiveView server side to make that work. But that would be really cool. You know, you talk about hmm. being able to integrate with a, a front end spa. It's like, well, what if you just had like this front end little reactor view component that's like embed the thing here and it's yeah. not doing an iframe and it's not having a lot of that other complexity you have. Yeah, iframes can bring with it a lot of a lot of uh, nasty side effects or complications to make that work well. Yeah. All right. Next up, uh, Phoenix Test Playwright version 0.6 was released, and uh, the big the, the big point of this release is the ability to manipulate cookies. So, Ooh. for example, if you want a fast non UI login, you know, within your integration tests, uh, that the, if you haven't heard of the the library, it's Phoenix Test. It's a plugin for Phoenix Test, I guess, uh, and it's a driver for Playwright, which is fully uh, end to end, you know, rendering of the whole thing. It's driving a uh, Chrome browser. Uh, conduct your tests using the phoenix test like internal api so very cool uh and manipulating cookies there that's that's almost a requirement for getting uh those end-to-end -end tests to be a little bit faster <laughs> yes and next up elixir will spawn more os processes for compiling depths in the future which may improve the performance around two times the pr has already been merged so this looks to be scheduled for elixir 1.19 and so currently imagine if I have a project that has a lot of depths, it's going to fetch them all download. The download might even be asynchronous, you know, put them in parallel. I don't know. But the, the most of the time is spent compiling them and that's compiling them sequentially, mm -hmm. even when I may have different depths that have no dependency on each other. Right. And so this change is saying, hey, we could partition this out and do compilation in parallel. For those dependencies that don't have interactions with each other mm -hmm. and that is very interesting so that i think the big benefit the big win there is with the cis you know with the big ci systems where they're continually maybe having to to run these things because normally the depths in a project aren't changing so often that it's impacting me running it locally where i'm having to do this all the time so i think yeah. it's that's where you're going to see the biggest benefit possibly if if you're constantly compiling your dependencies though you should probably cache that in your ci but uh, exactly. but when you yes. do when you do need <laughs> to compile it throw that environment variable mix os depths compile partition count <laughs> that's a mouthful into your environments and uh and yeah you'll get some speed improvements i think the benchmarks did around f uh, four processes seem to get you um the the, the two times improvement uh, mm. and 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 above that partition count you start to not see as much uh, benefit. Mm -hmm. Well, last up, Goatmire. We've been joking <laughs> about the name. The, the name might be a joke, too. It turns out it's not a joke. It's actually got some good <laughs> meaning to uh, behind it. Uh, and so they have it on their website uh, now. So it says, uh, from the website, Goatmire is a loose translation of, oh boy, of g g get a car? <laughs> get a car? <laughs> That's okay. It might be yet the care. I'm not Yet sure. To care. Okay. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's the historical name for Varberg, which uh, it, for w when it was a, a little more than a few houses, you know, back then. So Varberg is the, the city that this is being held in. Uh, and it is uh, still used in certain records. And so translating the name Varberg would have been far worse and does not make for a usable conference name. Like Goatmire just kind of sounds like that that uh that loose translation of the the original town name, so very very cool N nice callback you know uh to <laughs> to the city that it's being hosted in and still very attention grabbing so uh very clever and, and nice job there. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you for listening. We hope you'll join us next time on Thinking Elixir.